Uh, hi everyone, um, so today we're going to do stages of learning and I decided just to focus on one model for um, you know progression through learning and that's the Fitz and Posner's three stage model and there's three parts to it uh, there's the cognitive stage, associative stage and the autonomous stage and uh, we'll go through each stage individually first so first there's the learner goes through the cognitive stage this is when they're really beginners um, and this stage is high in cognitive load so cognitive load is how much uh, your cognition is working so you know your conscious mind is working and the beginners focus on the cognitive ori on orientated problems so sort of uh, what they have to do and strategies for how they do it it's all very thought through um, one of the things about cognition is quite slow. So this stage is characterized by the beginner's movements can be quite slow or they'll mistime things because they have to think it all through. Because of that, there tends to be a large number of errors um, and the error is also very large. And also there's high variability in it. Um, now, a lot, you know, generally you might think that high variability is a bad thing. However, you know, there's some conjecture around it. And my personal feeling of it is that um, the high variability is important because it really allows the learner to go through all different strategies to try and solve the movement problem. And in general, I like to think about it as a movement problem. Um, so it's not such a bad thing, high variability. And then lastly, there's limited self-correction and for coaching um, this is important to know because it really means that the coach can uh, or one of the roles of the coach is to actually direct the learner to where their errors are and to also give them alternate strategies um, at this stage of learning I, I think uh, coaching is probably of its highest value um, it's, it's very easy to point out and give su suggestions to learners and, and then help them move to the next stage so after the cognitive stage you then have the associative stage of learning um, and this is characterized by decreasing cognitive load so they don't need to think about it as much um, things start to happen more automatically and it's called the associative stage because of the association with the environmental cues um, with the movement goal. So what that means is they start being aware of different things in the environment to do with the skill they're trying to perform or they're performing. And those environmental cues get associated with the movement. Um, in a way, they, they cue the movement. So instead of having to think about, well, when this happens, then I have to do this. That start that link starts to become more and more automatic. Um, of course, there's a reduction in the number of size of the errors, and they start to acquire basic fundamentals or, you know, basic movement mechanics um, of the movement. So they they start to really get the basic idea of it. The variability decreases. So as they start to narrow down to what the effective strategies are for the movement, um, the variability will decrease. Um, and increase, included with that is an increase in error detection and self-correction. Now, from my own coaching experience, um, I find that this is important to note. So when you note that the learner starts to be able to go, oh, well, actually, that wasn't quite right and really needed to do this, and they do that on their own, then as a note, you can start thinking to yourself, okay, so they're getting better. Uh, they're, they're starting to correct their errors. And this is important because if um, they have to do their own self-practice, and most of the time that's the case because the coach only gets limited time with the actual learner, if they can correct their own errors or if they can identify their own errors that means that when they actually go do their practice it's going to be much more effective so I think in general one of the goals that coaches should focus on is 
trying to get them to a level where they can detect their own errors and then they can start to self-correct those errors. So that's the second stage or the intermediate stage and then they move on to the final stage. Now this is the autonomous stage. So here the skill becomes automatic or it re requires very little cognition at all. Um, so for most adults, you know, the really good examples are walking. You don't really need to think about walking. You just decide to go somewhere and your legs take you there. Um, so that's completely automatic. So it means nothing's going into um, your conscious mind to perform the action. It's all uh, happens subconsciously. Um, and included with this stage is the ability to dual task. And so that means that they can start to just focus on what else is going on and they don't need to really focus on the skill. The skill will do what it has to do. Um, there tends to be low variability. Now, the thing about variability is there's a lot of conjecture in the literature about variability. Um, different prominent researchers have different ideas. And one of the ones that's coming through is that um, maybe at the autonomous stage, the variability goes up a little bit from uh, what's happening at the associative stage. And the, th the thought to this is that the greater variability um, allow it allows them to be more flexible in their movements. Um, it allows for more novel situations. And on top of that, there might be some uh, movement economy that goes with it because if the movement's variable then it's not the same fiber types firing every single time and so those muscle fibers um, that fired the previous you know cycle or movement have a chance to actually recover before they go again so if there's if it's a very repetitive movement the variability can help um, reduce the fatigue so you know, it, it's theorized a little bit that there'll be high variability in the cognitive stage and then low variability in the associative stage. And as they move to the autonomous stage, then the variability goes up. Included in this is the ability to detect and correct errors. Now, this happens quite quickly for experts. So um, it's not really a cognitive thing. They don't really need to think about it. Just as they do it, they'll know whether the feeling was spot on or if it was slightly off and they'll just automatically adjust um, parts of their movement. It's, it's built into what they do. And so it's not, it's not so much a conscious thing. So in the autonomous stage, a lot of what was conscious at first is now very, very automatic. Um, one last thing, not all performers will get to the autonomous stage. Uh, we don't really know why that is. So, you know, sometimes they can be working, working, working. They just never really make the jump. Um, again, the literature is a bit grey there. We don't, we don't actually have the answer for why it is, but that just happens to be one of the things about it. So the next part I want to go through, and this relates to the three stages of learning, is the changes that you can expect with learning. Um, so the first one is the rate of improvement. So what we call these are like learning curves or performance curves. Um, it's really just a performance curve because we actually can't observe learning. We can only observe changes in performance and then from that we infer that learning has happened. But basically as the skill progresses, the rate of learning decreases or it's what we call diminishing returns. So at the beginning, the learner has very rapid improvement. Um, which is a little bit like strength training because at the beginning you gain strength very, very quickly. And same for motor skills. They'll, they'll gain um, increased performance quite fast, quite rapidly. Um, but then that diminishes. And so it takes a lot more work to, you know, improve any amount towards the, you know, expert end of the scale, or as the learner, as the learner or the performer is trying to become an expert, than it does when they first start off. Um, for coaches, I think that's important because if you're coaching at a high level, it means there's so much more work or effort needed to have any, um, you know, meaningful improvement. 
The other thing about it is don't get the idea that improvement just happens very smoothly. It tends to be a lot of plateaus in skill learning. So um, at the beginning, they'll tend to have a really big rapid uh, increase in performance. And then as they go through it, that tends to slow down or they'll have a plateau and then they might have another, you know, quick increase, increase in performance. Again, that may plateau, but it still generally follows the power law of practice principle, meaning that as they progress in their learning, each time they have a jump, it becomes a little bit smaller, even if they are um, non-linear non, non jumps, as it's not one continuous movement in, in improvement. There's changes in movement, in coordination patterns or movement patterns. Um, and this really comes from Nikolai Bernstein, who's the grandfather of motor control. And he noted that for a lot of movements, um, when you watch beginners do it, they freeze. And so you'll see they be characterized by rigid, stiff, um, you know, um, disjointed movements. And he theorized that that was because they freeze the degrees of freedom. When I say that, it's the kinematic degrees of freedom, not the control degrees of freedom, in order to make the movement problem simpler. Then as skill progresses, those degrees of freedom start to unfreeze. So more joints get involved um, and it, it becomes generally freer. So there's a few issues I think that's worth noting here. Um, one, if Bernstein was correct and the degrees freezing the degrees of freedom makes the control of the movement easier, I think as coaches you've got to be aware or you have to consider um, to not encourage them to necessarily unfreeze the degrees of freedom earlier. Um, my personal experience tells me that they will unfreeze as they progress through it and it's not something I have to you know, really concerned with. In fact, there might be a problem that if you get them to relax and unfreeze too early, then you increasing, you know, how many components need to be controlled or, or basically the degrees of freedom problem becomes larger. And so you could be hindering their learning. And so it's something to be aware of that you let them naturally go through that stage. Um, and then you'll see as they get better, that they will progress and then naturally the degrees of freedom will, will, will unfreeze or, or the kinematic degrees of freedom will unfreeze. Um, you know, what I've seen is particularly in or observing dance teachers, quite often they will ask the beginner student to relax too early and I'm not sure if that's necessarily a good strategy. Um, then we move on to muscular activity. So as the learner progresses, muscular activity decreases. And because the amount of muscular activity is really the main determinant to how much uh, energy is expended in the movement, um, if there's a decrease in muscular activity, then you, know, you can expect an associated increase in movement economy. Um, just, yeah. And... Just as a side note, so I use the word economy rather than efficiency because efficiency is a very exact thing and, and there's a lot of activities that's very hard to measure the efficiency of an action. Um, but as a generalization, they're sort of interchangeable, but they're slightly different. So movement, movement economy is how much um, output there is per cycle, where efficiency is your metabolic output divided by your mechanical output, and that gives you your, or is it the other way around? But that gives you your efficiency. So um, as muscle activity goes down, but if the external output remains the same, then you can assume that the movement economy goes up, which is when we get to energy expenditure, pretty much the same thing. So um, yeah, for the same external output, there will be an in, a decrease in energy expenditure. So they'll be producing um the same or more with less, um, and therefore an increase in economy of movement. 
The next part, this is, I think, very important because I think this is a big deal when it comes to the difference between beginners, intermediates, and experts. Um, so beginners attend to many and inappropriate environmental cues. So their visual selective attention is not good. And what we find is that they actually look at a lot of stuff, but they don't really look at the right stuff. Um, and then as learning progresses, attention gets directed to less and more appropriate environmental cues. And one of the ways that this gets tested is they have these special glasses that will actually record the eye movements of the participant. And so what they know is that beginners will have a lot more eye movements and they will fixate the eye not as long on certain environmental cues. Where experts will have less eye movements and they'll stay looking at the same spot or the same thing for much longer. Um, you know, most of that's built through experience. So with their experience, they know where to look and because they know where to look, they can look at that longer and they get the correct information and the information is going to actually help with the performance of it. I really think in very complex sports that are open environments like any of the field sports, rugby union, rugby league, um, soccer, AFL, netball, um, there's heaps of hockey, there's heaps of them, that really one of the main objectives of the coach is to actually um, structure the learning environments so that they gain more and more experience at identifying what the cues are. Um, and a good example of, you know, why this is true is in Major League Baseball, if there's a fastball thrown, it will arrive at the batter from the moment it leaves the pitcher's hand in less than 200 milliseconds of a, of a second. And we know that it takes about 200 milliseconds to actually make a decision. So the ball arrives at the batter before the batters have even had time to follow the ball with their eye. And they would have had to actually make the decision about how they're going to bat in order to predict where the ball's going to be and the shot before it's even left the pitcher's hand. And so what the expert batter has is they've learnt the cues from the pitcher so that they can predict. And so that's, again, you know, their visual selective attention is good. They pick up the right information to help them actually perform the skill. Um, we already talked about conscious demands changing, and so obviously the, con uh, the cognitive load goes down as they move through skill. Um, we talked already a bit about error detection and correction. So again, as someone gets better and better and better, they can correct their errors or they can detect their errors and correct them more effectively. Um, I think as a coach, one of the things is you don't want to create dependency on the learner. So the learner can become very dependent on the coach. And so, um, which we'll probably talk about a little bit more next week, when it comes to feedback or, you know, pointing out their errors and, and giving them help, you have to actually, I mean, at the beginning when they're a learner, you probably have to help them quite a lot. But as they progress through it, you want to naturally help them less and less and less and make them more and more independent and less dependent on you as the coach. So I remember watching an interview with Michael Phelps' coach and, uh, I mean, it's his job, so he has to go to the swimming meets. But his, his attitude was at the actual competition that he didn't really give his swimmers any advice or anything in the comp. He might tell them, oh, you know, you're in heat three, for instance, but he doesn't really give them any feedback. And that's really because he believes that as he trains them, he wants them to become more and more independent. Um, because if he doesn't, then they'll become dependent on him. And that's actually quite a bad situation to be in. So it's always something you should be aware of as coaches. Then you have brain activity. So the brain actually changes. It's called neuroplasticity. Um, or the brain reorganizes as the learning progresses. So this... Um, never changes through life. You have neuroplasticity right to the day you die, really. Um, but what it does is means the skill gets really quite hardwired in there. The brain actually changes. So the expert, their brain is actually different to a beginner's. And at the beginning, you don't really have those neural pathways that, that are hardwired in. So you've got to control the skill from existing pathways. But as you do the skill more and more and more, 
then the you know the brain remolds or reorganizes and then it becomes more and more hardwired um, that takes time but so the next one and this relates to the previous things that we went through is what things do expertise actually have what makes them experts um, and the first one is the amount and type of practice um, now Erickson he you know spent his life researching on uh, what is talent and what makes talent and he came up with or the way he described talent was the fulfillment of ability okay so when when they talk about someone's really natural when they're young that's they've got a great ability for the actual activity but for them to actually be talented or to have any talent they actually need to get to an adult and perform at the highest level um, or fulfill their their ability to perform at the highest level and what he found that two things that are needed you need to have intense practice for a minute for a minimum of 10 years and what he meant by intense is deliberate practice um, or it's quite common out there is the 10,000 hour rule uh, Ericsson you know he's the guy that came up with that um, and there were some other ideas that he has so I'm pretty sure he he identified that mental toughness and you know parental support they're, they're two of the biggest um, you know predictors of whether someone's talented or not um, in terms of talent or talent ID uh, from his perspective he doesn't give much credit to talent ID um, because really it comes down to how much practice someone does so even if uh, there is someone they're young and they seem to have a lot of ability if they don't have that toughness to actually do the training that's needed over like a minimum of 10 year period and probably longer because you know you question how much uh, like young kids have um, deliberate practice um, or even the actual amount of practice but it takes it takes quite a bit so that's a little bit about Ericsson's stuff and then the next thing is experts have great knowledge structures so one of the things that's common amongst expert performers is they really know what they're doing um, now they might not know in a scientific sense but they know in an intuitive sense and they've got very good organization for what they're, they're doing what they're trying to do what they're trying to achieve so what the goals are and, and the strategies involved um, including this with, with this is they have more decision rules for guiding specific situations and this is important because these rules become sort of automatic so as soon as they see a situation they already have a predetermined rule for actually dealing with that situation um, and on top of that that means that when there's a novel situation they can recognize it for what it is and where someone else gets stumped uh, they have a better chance of actually coming up with a strategy for dealing with that novel situation because they have so much experience so really the more experience they have then the better their knowledge structures are um, they have better problem solving decision making, decision making anticipation and I really think a lot of this is through experience so they can solve the problems because even if it's a novel problem it might be similar to other problems they've already solved to do with that skill or activity um, and then they can make these decisions faster because they have the, the experience and, and most of the time they'll be more accurate because they can have a general idea of what the situation or the outcome if they act this way to the situation will be um, and then they have a really quite enhanced anticipation and I think this is really really important because uh, in some sense all skill really to some point is about anticipation even if you think about it, it takes time for the signal to get from the brain to the muscles to the effectors and so for something to be timed just at the right moment means that the brain has had to anticipate the timing of that activity and it has to have sent the signal ahead of time and so even though we're talking about where minute amounts of time here um, it, it still had to anticipate and so as they 
as someone becomes an expert, their, their ability to anticipate what's going on becomes better and better and better. And then we already talked about use of visual cues and how that kind of gets teased out. Um, we're going to move on to practice conditions because for coaching, I think this is really, really important, um, how you manipulate practice or, or what the implications are. So in practice distribution schedule, um, there's two components of it. So the length of the practice and the rest intervals. Um, and just two general types of practice. You can either do practice in mass um, or mass practice, which is increased length um, with decreased lengths of rest intervals. And um, I really think this is the more traditional type of practice. Um, when someone says, oh, you need to work harder, I really feel that that's what they're talking about. Like, just do more mass practice. And then you have distributed practice, which has a decrease in length and increase in the length of rest intervals. Basically, you do shorter actual training, um, but you have more rest or more frequent rest in, in within the training session or even between training sessions. Um, now, interestingly, is that there's benefits of distributed practice. So when it comes to learning skills, the amount of fatigue you have is a com important consider consideration. And by breaking the practice up and using a distributed practice strategy, um, fatigue will go down because they don't they can they've got time to recover all the time. And because of this, the cognitive effort goes up. Um, and this is important because if they get bored, they stop working on the movement problem especially early on in learning, but all the way through it, really. Um, so you do want them when they're practicing. They need to be engaged. If they're not engaged, then the practice is not going to be very, very effective. And so a distributed practice means that the likelihood of them being engaged in the practice is going to be much, much better. Um, and they both, in, both of those effects, so fatigue and cognitive effort, they influence the learning process. Um, in particular, they influence the retention of performance. And included in that is um, memory consolidation, um, which increases with a distributed practice model. So memory consolidation is actually where the events of the day or whatever you've learnt gets actually um, processed in the brain and, and starts to move more and more into long-term memory. And so it generally, they think it happens at night when you're asleep, and so the more distributed it is, the more rest you've got. And because memory consolidation happens when you rest, um, those experience, cause experiences can get into long-term memory and they can make a bigger impact. So um, the distribution of practice across several days provides a better opportunity for the memory consolidation process to take place. Now, this is no different um, whether it's a skill, a motor skill or a cognitive skill. Um, and... Because this is a first year subject, I always think it's worth noting that um, at university or university level, you're always learning cognitive skills and you're, you know, increasing your knowledge and your experience in that type of field. Uh, if you study for 20 hours, but you cram, so you might do it the week before like an exam, um, or if you still study 20 hours, so the amount of study doesn't change, but you distribute that over the whole semester. The person that distributes it over the whole semester, they're going to outperform the person that just cramps. And the reason they're going to outperform the person is because they have more opportunities to consolidate their learning in memory. So they have more opportunities for memory consolidation. Um, so take home message is try never to cram study. Always try to study in a distributed you know, fashion as well. So do shorter sessions with more breaks. I mean, you might have more shorter sessions, sure, but um, try not to do your study in maths. Do them with, you know, uh, breaks in between time so that your brain actually absorb what's going on. Then you've got constant versus variable practice. Um, so constant practice means that there's only one variation in the practice situation. So they're your very old-fashioned drills. You just keep doing the same thing over and over and over. Um, variable practice involves a variety of movements and context characteristics and practical situations. Um, so it basically gets mixed up. And the example I've given is the game sense approach, which is where you get 
you know, small-sided games that um, kind of mimic the competition environment, but they're a lot smaller. And because the learners will be using quite a lot of different skills, um, the practice is a lot more variable. And that means that they getting used to more situations, which is also helping the environmental cues. So they're getting their, their ability to learn what the different cues are in the environment increases. Um, now, the idea about more sided games or game sense is that um, if you had a full team playing, then the amount of on the ball time is going to be greatly decreased. So the learners can get a lot more um, on the ball time because there's less players in the game, but they still get the opportunity to start learning those environmental cues or dealing with the variability in the situation. Um, they'll have to perform a lot more variations of skill. Um, so there's two considerations to really consider. Now, variable practice is related to successful future performances. Um, so what they found is, you know, people that do variable practice, they tend to be more successful as they go down in their, you know, or as their skill increases or they go into their career. And they get, they gain the ability to um, adapt to novel conditions. So, you know, when they're less rigid in, in the way they approach the skill. And so if there's a situation that they haven't really seen before, they tend to be able to deal with that a lot easier than someone that has been trained in a very more constant practice or a traditional approach. Uh, this is just an example of how you can break up the variable practice. So if you had block practice, you might just do, and we're talking about a throwing skill here. So underarm might be day one, overhand might be day two, and sidearm might be day three. And that's all you work on in each day. If we have random, then each random, it gets broken up into all three um, skills or subcomponents of the skills. And they're really just in a very random order. And then on top of that, you have very serial, where they just do the skills in a very serial sense. Now, um, this is dependent on activity. So because I teach dancing and I know that in the competition, um, there is some openness that I have to deal with. But generally speaking, they have to perform their routines, which is their routines are serial. So I get them to do a lot of the practice, which is they're going through the routines and in the order that they expect the routines to be, um, or they will have to perform the routines in a, in a competition. So in that case, I don't really move uh, my students or, or, or my learners to ra a random approach because um, even though there are random elements in the environment, environment in terms of what they have to do or, or their sequences, um, they're not random, they're serial. But I don't really do that much block practice with them. So that's an example of, you know, it is dependent on the skill or the activity you're trying to facilitate, um, but you have to be aware of that. There's this idea of contextual interference. So the definition is a disruption or interference of performance due to performing multiple variations of skill within the practice context. Um, and yeah, mixing up, that's going to create some contextual interference in it. Um, basically, what they found is when some contextual interference is added into practice and skill learning, um, although the performance of the skill during practice might go down or, or might not seem to improve as quick. When it comes to the retention of the skill, so being able to do the skill in the future or retention tests, or actual transfer of the skill into a performance situation, it tends to increase. And so um, there's lots of different ways you can add contextual interference. Um, for Again, for the field sports, you know, they know statistically that there's an advantage at playing at home versus playing, you know, at away games. And some of that can be to do with the, uh, you know, the dislike the audience has for the away team. And uh, we're very social creatures, so we pick up on that. So, you know, something that a coach might be able to do is get an audio of an away game and the type of sounds and, you know, um, maybe some of the comments that might go on from the audience. 
Um, and you might play that as quite loud as they perform the skill to try and give them some sort of interference, contextual interference. Now, even though in the practice environment that might be a distraction and might initially decrease performance in the practice environment, in the actual performance environment, um, what's been shown is is there's likely to be an increase in performance. And, you know, for me that makes sense because they're actually practicing in an environment similar to what they need to perform in. Um, so it's always worth noting that at some point you want to put contextual interference into the training um, as you go through and help facilitate people's movements. Um, so there's some issues that you need to consider, like because block practice definitely doesn't really have any contextual interference. Now, if the re retention test was block, then it would be appropriate just to use block practice because, um, or the performance environment, because that's going to be the environment they're they're working in. Um, so something like throwing darts, for instance, um, although you might have the audience that they have to deal with, but but if in general, you know, assuming that it's quiet, then the just doing the very blocked practice of throwing the dart. Um, and then because the, the way the, the performance environment is, that might be valid. Um, but block practice decreases performance in random condition retention tests. So as the condition becomes more and more random or variable or it gets more and more mixed up, then block practice becomes more like less and less effective. Um, and the block practice, which is low contextual interference, that develops a context dependency. So we had talked earlier on about having a dependency on the coach. Um, the context dependency is also something that you want to kind of avoid. Now for dancers, um, it's not so much to do with block practice, but it's to do with dependency. So this idea of if you practice in front of the mirror and even in the gym for that matter, um, that potentially you're creating dependency on the mirror and actually the skill so that they can't actually perform the skill at its most effective level if they don't have a mirror in front of them. And so again, that's something you've got to be quite aware of all the time. Um, there's limitations of contextual interference, of course. So we're not sure from the research how much of the effect is because it's in the laboratory versus an applied setting. Um, or it could also be due to the actual practice amount. And the second consideration is actually learner characteristics. So really age and skill. Um, so because block practice is easier on the cognitive load, uh, as a coach, I think it would be quite reasonable to use block practice early in learning because um, at the cognitive stage of learning, there's so much to think about that's going on in a lot of skills that um, if you can make the learning easier, then you just remove some of the, the challenge or the difficulty and, and really allows them to just prioritize on, on certain aspects of the skill. So low skilled individuals, block practice, um, you know, as a strategy can be considered effective, but as a coach, you need to be aware that you need to transition them from block practice to more serial and, and random practice, depending on the skill itself. And the other thing is children. So children, um, if things are getting changed around too much, then they just won't be able to handle it. Um, and so block practice can be effective there. Having said that, children don't have very long attention spans. So even with block practice, you want to have shorter blocks of skill and that it's changing all the time. Um, but in each block, you might just work on one thing because, you know, you don't want the, to lose the, the kid's attention or for them to get bored. So practice specificity, um, you know, the, in this hypo hypothesis, um, motor skill learning is specific to the practice condition characteristics. And so what this is really just saying is, um, if you, for the best performance in a way, you need to train how you're going to compete or, or you train 
training environments or train situations or train it the way that it is done in performance. And so if you, the more and more you train that way, then the more you can sort of expect that to come out in the performance situation. Um, and that makes, you know, sense that it's, you, you got to train specifically for what you sort of want. Um, there's three parts to this. So you have the sensory perceptual, um, the cognitive processes that need to go on in the environmental context. And so, again, as you progress them through, you want to kind of try and to manipulate those three um, areas to be more and more like the performance environment or the, or the game. And going back to game sense, that's why game sense or the the idea of game sense makes makes a lot of sense because it gives them closer to the sensory perceptual um, specific to the performance environment and also the environmental context and, and because they have to think and make decisions within the small games and then you can change the games that make them get bigger um, that makes it more specific to what they would actually have to do in, in the environment. Practice variability, uh, this is just in practice specificity, this is just to do with a summary of it. So in the variability you've got contextual interference effect and then movement characteristics. Um, and then you've got the three parts of, you know, practice specificity. Um, so sensory perceptual uh, context, cognitive process, practice and test context. So basically you need to practice the way it's going to be tested. <coughs> The final section we're going to go through today is overlearning, um, whole and part practice. So overlearning, which is defined as the continuation of practice beyond the amount needed to achieve a certain performance criteria. Um, and just remember that performance curves don't necessarily mean learning. Uh, so it means that you might be uh, training, training, training. It might not come out in the performance straight away. So, but down the track it might be better better performance in the long term. And there's some evidence for that. So there's some evidence that, um, again, people that make expert, they keep going back to refine their skill. So it's not just a straight linear process that you go from cognitive to associative and then to autonomous. You can actually then go back down and re-go into the associative stage where you're rethinking about it, you're refining it, you're you're building your knowledge again. And I really think that's where the, the experts have a greater uh, knowledge structure because they keep going back. They keep thinking about it in a different way. And then they reintegrate that that back through into an automatic movement. Um, generally, over, overlearning benefits retention of performance. So generally, overlearning is effective. Uh, you know, it's one of the things about coaching is to you need to be able to motivate people to do more learning than, you know, just to get to where the skill is proficient for what they're trying to do, but even more learning than that. Um, but the thing is, is it true for all types of So it could be construction of a gun, for instance, um, or cleaning the weapon or whatever it might be. There might be some industrial process that happens and um, if they overlearn it, then they will perform better less errors um, and the rest of that goes with the increase in performance of skill. Um, however, they haven't found it on dynamic balance. So, I mean, you can train your dynamic balance to a certain extent, um, but there's a point of like very rapid diminishing returns. Uh, so additional practice beyond a certain amount is not proportional, proportionally more beneficial to retention of the performance. So sort of once the learner develops the required balance for the task, um, in terms of balancing, they won't really need to focus on that and you don't really need to focus on that either from that point because over-learning or over-focus on that is not going to transfer, um, transfer into meaningful performance improvements. And there's just a little balance in apparatus. Um, so some considerations for overlearning so for simple tasks you've just got to be aware if they're overlearning it um you know boredom can kick in which means the attention decreases and their cognitive effort goes down which is all a bad thing and, and a lot of that's to do with like if it's in practice although you can do a distributed practice model if it's a simple task where or you know there's components of simple tasks where the, they focus on each simple task um 
at different times and you can still overlearn them and try and mitigate these effects of boredom and decreased attention and, and decreased cognitive effort. Um, and then, you know, and this is the same as boredom. So the more monotonous practice um, is, then there's a decrease in memory function and the and its ability to adapt. So, you know, again, to throw variability into it, to keep things interesting um, and keep the learner engaged is really, really important. And it's an important consideration if you're going to just do overlearning, if you're going to do overlearning. Um, because if you just do overlearning in mass, um, then it may not be so effective. So we get to whole and part practice. Um, now, really, it's to do with the complexity and organization skill that provides the basis of whether you're going to use whole practice or you're going to use part practice. So whole practice is where the learner just does the whole skill in its whole entirety, where part practice is it gets breaking down into its subcomponents. Um, skill complexity is related to how many parts of the skill um, are in the task, um, or it relates to the degree of attention demands of the task. So you have uh, you know, less complex skills, which have less parts in it, um, or more complex skills. So that's one factor in whether you're going to use whole part practice. And then the skill organization, which refers to, to the components of the task, um, how they're spatially and temporal, temporally or in time interrelated. So there's a high organized skill, so it's highly interrelated, and the example is like running, um, then that's a high organized skill. Um, and then you have low organized skills, which is, has low inter, you know, relationships between the, the movements or the parts, like typing a book. Each keystroke of your fingers is independent of really of the next. Um, so there's like low organization. So when it comes to whole or part practice, deciding which method to sort of use, um, it kind of works this way. If the skill is low in complexity and high in organization, um, then it's recommended you use whole practice. So for instance, there's a lot of gates. So if it's running, walking, those type of things, they tend to be cyclical. Um, they'll be high in complexity, uh, sorry, low in complexity. They're not actually that complex compared to some things that people can do but they're very high in organization. Every part is interrelated to the next one. And a lot of throwing is sort of the same and kicking as well. Um, so it's not a good idea to break those skills up too much, just perform them all in one go. Um, however, skills that are high in complexity and low in organization, um, part practice is um, shown to be effective in, in helping to uh, develop those skills. Um, and the one that always comes to my mind when I think of that, because it's so complex, is dancing, where it's very, very complex, but, um, you know, how interrelated each movement is from the next is less so. Um, so it tends to be lower in organisation. And so part practice, and that's, you know, true of a lot of dance instruction, dance teaching, um, is it gets broken into its components, into its parts, and, and the, the learner will focus on those parts. Um, however, during whole practice, learners' attention can be focused on specific qualities to be developed. So one of the, there's this concept about um, when you're facilitating skill of, or directing and focusing attention. And so even though that the learner might be performing the skill in whole, as the coach, you can actually focus their attention. Okay, so as you do the skill, I want you to be aware of this or I want you to concentrate on improving this and so you can direct their attention and by directing their attention they can work on specific parts while doing you know the whole skill because um, I think that's the, the the part when people hear about this idea of practicing the whole skill in one go is that well how are we meant to develop any part of it and so this is the idea behind that um, now it's not so much in the McGill book or I don't remember seeing it in the McGill book but it in a lot of other texts, um, they consider this. And so one of the things that you might consider prescribing is a whole part, whole practice um, regime So, or, or intervention or facilitating it that way. So first you get the learner to practice the skill in its entirety. And that might even if it's a brand new skill, just like, like you know, generally I just say to them, just get in and have a go. It doesn't really matter. Um, so they, they try and do the skill all in one go. Then you break it up into the, their 
parts or, or the subcomponents and you get them to work on individual things and then you put the skill all back together so you, you make sure that they practice it all all as one skill again rather than in subcomponents in parts of it and um, you know that's worth thinking about and I think in general that's quite effective.